Hello and welcome everybody and thank you for, for joining. Hello, here we go, Adam and David. Uh, thanks for, for joining for this special AuraDB Office Hours episode in March 2022. Um, hope you're all doing well um, wherever you are, wherever you're watching this. Uh, and thank you again for taking the time, Adam and David, for making it happen today. How, how is everybody? <laughs> I'm doing great. Well, you know, we, we we picked a time that would hopefully work with a lot of different time zones. So it's still here in East Coast USA morning hours, and I'm suitably caffeinated, ready to go. How are you doing, Adam? <laughs> yeah, all good. Yeah, it's coming to the end of the day for me. But um, yeah, I'm happy to to be here. Excited to uh, to see what people come up with in terms of questions. Exactly. That that's that's the perfect perfect intro. So we, today we we'd like to uh, take the session and answer your questions you have. If you have uh, you know installed uh, well not installed really but launched a AuraDB instance uh, recently and are struggling with some things, uh, wondering other things or have have questions you you'd like us to to answer for you. Uh, don't be shy uh, and, and type them in. There is a a, a Slido link where we are collecting all the all the questions. So. Uh, if you click on that link, uh, I'll post it in, in chat in a second. Also, um, you can you can type your uh, your question in there. You can obviously also use just a chat uh, window and uh, and type it there. But then it might be lost. So please use the Slido. But uh, just in case, um, we will have a look out on the chat messages anyways. Uh, so that's not a um, nothing should get lost. So yes, perfect. Thank you, David. You have already the the thing here already now it's our, our, our faces are a little bit uh, in front of it but I, I think it still should work uh, for everybody yep. yeah this this link right here if you're following along or watching on the stream this link right here dev.neo4j.com slash ara ama02 that's where you can go directly pose us a question um, uh, you know, I thought maybe we should just give brief introductions about ourselves and where we're coming from, and then we can jump right in. We've got a number of questions pre-submitted. We'll just go through them one by one. Um, on the Slido, there's a voting mechanic. So if you see a question that you share or that you really want the answer to, please upvote that question and we'll do them in the order of their popularity. Um, so is it okay if I, we do some brief introductions, Alex? That's totally okay. Yeah, that, let's, let's start with that. Um... I, before you start with the introduction, because quickly we will record the session, obviously. So if you are watching the, want to watch this later on, you can. Uh, I'll send out the link to everybody that has uh, registered via um, the registration form. Um, and um, yeah, with that, uh, I'll I'll hide my face uh, and you uh, you dive in. <laughs> Enjoy. Sure. Thank you. Um, so my name is David Allen. I have been with Neo4j for about four years. Um, remarkably privileged to work in the developer relations group here at Neo4j and basically what we do all day every day is it's our business to try to make people successful with Neo4j. We try to teach people how to write applications, try to help them out when they're having trouble, and we also help to curate and shape the, the community. Um, for me in particular, I came to Graph in, I think it was about 2014, where I was writing a graph-oriented application and the performance was just absolutely terrible. I mean, I built it as best I could on top of MySQL, um, but I kind of came to a little bit of an aha moment when I realized that I was trying to model a graph on top of tables. Uh, some people told me, hey, you should check out this crazy Neo4j thing. They introduced me to a guy named Michael Hunger. Some folks in the community may know him and uh, got pretty deeply involved ever since. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. Uh, Adam, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I'm Adam Cowley. Um, so I'm based in Swindon, sunny Swindon, Wiltshire um, in the UK. Um, I've been at NIFJ for about five years now, um, and a NIFJ user for, I guess, for almost a decade. Um, I started using NIFJ just after Cypher was released, if that's any, uh, any indication. Um, I joined NFJ as a field engineer um, those sort of five years ago um, and then joined the DevRel team, uh, I think about a year and a half ago. Um, so I look after Graph Academy, which is our free online training platform. Um, so in the past nine months or so, um, the platform has been completely rebuilt from scratch uh, with more exciting kind of hands-on courses um, that aim to, to teach uh, users with the, the same tools that they'd use on a on day-to-day -day basis. So when you sign up to most of the courses, you'll get like an integrated sandbox 
Um, and then you can um, learn along um, and sort of code along as you learn uh, using a, an EFJ browser uh, window on the uh, on, on the right hand side of the, the screen. Um, right now, I'm personally working on app development courses. So before joining EFJ, I was a, a web developer, um, and so that's my, my my focus at the moment. And we're also looking at, at, at GDS at the moment. Uh, if anyone's interested in, in looking at the courses, then head over to graphacademy.efj.com um, and sign up. And if there's anything listed has come in soon. Uh, register your interest and then we'll use it to um, prioritize our uh, roadmap. All right. Um, with that, maybe we should just go ahead and jump in and get to some of your questions. Um, so let's see. Over here uh, within our um, Slido, uh, Gabriel is asking whether multiple database management is on the roadmap for ARA. Uh, this is a big question. So let's dig into this a little bit. The answer is right now that this particular feature is under review for a couple of different reasons. So folks may be familiar that in Neo4j Enterprise, um, there's a multi-DB cap capability where within one database management system, you can create as many different databases as you want. That behavior isn't yet supported within ARA. So inside of the database, the way multi-database works is that it's a set of shared resources. So if you have things like memory, CPU, page cache, disk, all of those resources are shared among all of the different databases. And with an ARA, they're looking at how they can expose multi-database within ARA without necessarily allowing those resources to conflict with one another. Additionally, like in the ARA context, um, it's really important that we basically keep that service up and running 24 seven and that everything works smoothly. And so, if one database becomes unavailable due to a problem while the others are available, there's some, some questions there that our internal engineering teams are trying to resolve around what does it mean for a database to be available and how do we make sure that all of those things are healthy at the same time. So this one's under review for those kinds of reasons. Now, another option that we've got over time with Neo4j ARA is to simply make it easy to programmatically create and delete ARA instances. And so there's some argument to be made there that maybe you don't want multiple databases within one database management system, but it would be better just to have lots of different ARA instances that you can separately um, monitor and, uh, and work with. Remember, if ARA does a good job of taking away all of the management pain of that for you, it should be that one is just as easy as the other. So, um, you know, thanks for this question, Gabriel. I went back and I talked to our internal product management team and they haven't yet given me clear line of sight to say, okay, this is definitely going to be delivered and it's going to be on this particular um, date, but it's something our internal engineering teams are are thinking a lot about right now. Um, Ad Adam, is there anything that you want to add on this question? Um, not not too much really. I, I guess the the only other thing to to note is that where you've got sort of multi multiple databases, um, you can create on a single instance. Um, in um, NFJ sort of enterprise version. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy enough just to create another um, instance inside or just by clicking, you know, create, create database and going from there. Obviously, there's a, the additional cost there. Um, but yeah, you, you can spin up as many databases as, as you need to. Thanks for that question, Gabriel. Um, to go to the next question, also from Gabriel, uh, this is about a flexible plugin system. So many folks who have been using Neo4j for years might be familiar with um, stored procedures and custom procedures within the, within the APOC library. There are several in there, for example, APOC load JDBC that would allow you to contact a remote database like Oracle, MySQL, or Postgres, and then load data straight out of those. Um, so here, Gabriel's question is about a flexible plugin system, but I wanna take this in a slightly di different direction. To, to answer the question quite straightforwardly, the flexible plugin system is not on the roadmap, and here's why. Um, when you're dealing in a managed services world, you know, Neo4j is running and operating that database for you, the stability and safety of the database is of the utmost concern. Now, in order to use something like APOC load JDBC, you're also going to need a third party jar, like for example, the drivers for uh, Postgres or MySQL or Oracle or whatever the case may be. Um, Folks who run and operate managed services really don't like plugins and custom jars in their ecosystem because now it becomes, you know, really critical that we be able to vouch for the safety, performance, effectiveness of sometimes third-party code. And so as a result of all of that, 
we're looking to expose the same kind of functionality, but not through APOC per se, not through um, custom jars or custom plugins that you would load into your R instance. Um, an early example of how we're doing this kind of integration stuff and is the Spark connector, which would let you do the same thing as APOC load JDBC does today. Uh, the Kafka connector, uh, Neo4j's BI connector, and so on. And so what I think you're going to see out of Neo4j going forward is less emphasis placed on plugins when inside of managed services and more emphasis placed on connectors and things that work through the bolt and client layer back and forth. And um, that does a couple of things for us. It lets us keep the managed service safe and secure and really easy to operate. And secondly, it makes it more flexible for you because even if we give you a way of putting a plugin inside of that database, um, we're still going to need a way of life cycling and changing and patching and all of the good things around that software. So by pushing some of that stuff to the client layer outside of the database, it's much more flexible and robust in the, in the long term. Um, Adam? Um, well, I guess I, um, APOC itself has, has got a lot of um, sort of procedures and functions in there. But so I think it's over 500 now, which uh, may even do what you need to do. So some of those are, are disabled for security reasons um, for because of you know, kind of cross-tenancy and, and things like that. Um, but it, it, um, it may be a case that, that what you're looking for is, is actually there. Um, and then I've, I've also got to give a shout out to our professional services teams. Um, so if you have the, the, the right contract with us, then uh, it may be a case that um, you could get your own procedures verified by uh, one of our team or even built by, by one of our team and um, deployed to, to the instance. Yeah, that's a great call out. There are some customers who are currently doing that. Um, uh, Thank you, Gabriel, for this question. Um, if we didn't nail some aspect of it, feel free to submit a follow-up and we can we can get to it as we go along. Um, uh, Salua asks the question, how do we schedule an automatic export for RADB on a daily basis? Adam, do you want to take a stab at this or should I? Um, yeah, I, I can take take the first stab at it. Yeah, so um, you can um, export manually on on a day to day basis. So you, um, there are regular snapshots taken in in the Aura console um, that you can download at, at any point. Um, so in terms of the the automatic uh, exports, though, uh, I think it really depends on the the kind of format that that you're looking for um, and and the the kind of output you're um, you're looking for. Uh, if it's a uh, if it's a dump, then there's no uh, nothing there at the moment I'm aware of. Um, but you could quite easily write something uh, in in another service that would um, or like use a, a cron job or something like that to to, to run the export um, by connecting over Bolt and then you know pulling the the, the data back from there. Yeah. So the I, I mean the only other thing I'd add to that is um, one of the things we're planning on having coming is. Uh, uh, an externally accessible API that you can use for interacting with a lot of RADB functions on a regular basis. And so I think an important thing to note is what Adam said, Aura is already backing up for you automatically on a daily basis. I suspect Lua may be interested in how to automatically download that file. And for that, that's on its way through the, the interaction API that we're working on building. Um, so this next question isn't actually a question, but um, I am not familiar with the Indonesian language myself, but earlier today I looked this up and uh, this translates to thank you very much for the help. I say thank you very much. And so thank you. <laughs> next question. Uh, so Isaac. Is there a way for my node to have a range of values for a property? Ooh, man, this is a, this is a cool question. Um, there are a lot of different ways. Uh, Adam, ju jump in if you want to grab this. Like, I, I could spin this in quite a few different directions, but um, so definitely yes. And the answer is. Uh, um, there are several different ways of doing it depending on uh, how you want to approach the, the, the modeling perspective. Um, so the, the simplest way that I can think of to do it is that properties inside of Neo4j can contain arrays. 
Um, so you could have, for example, um, uh, an array uh, like a, a property value, let's call it um, favorite color. And the, the property value could be an array of strings. And so a person could have multiple favorites. Uh, they could have red, yellow, orange, blue, and green as all of their favorites. Or a person could have an age property. Let's say we don't know with precision how old the person is. Let's say it's a historical personage where we can't fix their uh, date of birth. Um, you could have a two element array that basically says, here's the low end of the, of the person's age and here's the high end of the range. So that by using a two value array, you can have a range. That's all within a property. Another way of doing this is basically, you know, Neo4j at its core relates nodes to other nodes. So a very straightforward way of doing this is to establish the range of values as other nodes that you simply link to. Um, in terms of which one of those approaches would be best, um, there's a series of articles that I wrote on Medium that's about graph modeling trade-offs. I can pull up some of those and show people an example in a second. Those go into much more depth about some of the, the data modeling trade-offs when you're creating a property value graph. But um, I think broadly your options are linking to other nodes or using multi-valued attributes in an array form. Um, which one of those would be better? I, I, I wouldn't really take a position on without understanding your problem. Uh, it it kind of depends on what, you, what you're doing with those range of values after the fact in the context of a query. Um, I'm going to pull that article up just so I can show it briefly on my screen. But uh, Adam, do you want to add anything? Um, so uh, like I said, I used to be in the, the uh, field team at NFJ working with clients like the the answer that, that I gave most commonly, and it's a very frustrating answer, is that it depends, right? And it kind of depends on, on what you want to do and, and what that range is. Um, like you say, like the the, the um, storing a um, an array with with two numbers in there could be the, the best option for you if, if you want to store um, that value, like a min max. Um, or if you added um, sort of two properties, say, I don't know, salary min and salary max um, to, to, to a... Um, to, to a user node or to a person node. Um, then you'd have the um, the ability of, of searching index uh, on that as well to find out, um, you know, do a, a range search on that on that value and say, you know, where these two values are um, in between this uh, this particular range. Um, but yeah, like it, it's, it's, I know it's frustrating, but it it depends. Like, <laughs> or depends on, yeah. on on what you want to do with it. So I'm I'm not going to go through this article, but if folks look up this article after the fact, this will give the 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 much longer, more detailed answer. But there's more than one way to do it. Uh, data modeling is part art, part science. If you understand your context and your application scenario, you can really kill it and do a great job on some of these choices. In the abstract, people like us got to say it depends and and. You know, you follow up with somebody in the context of your problem and make a, a more point decision, if that makes sense. Let's see now. Um, Isaac asks, I need to be able to build a transaction node that has as a property a list of nodes from a path in their ordinal order. Any thoughts on how I can address this? Now, let me parse this carefully and make sure I understand it. A transaction node, so a, a, a transaction node might be, I, I wonder if he means here like a financial transaction um, or whether he means like a database transaction and a property, a list of nodes from a path in their ordinal order. Okay, I can, I kind of want to take this two different ways. I we, we can definitely talk about how you would do that in Cypher, but a different way that I might want to take this is, is it wise to do that? <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, so a way to do this, and I'm wondering if we can um, pull up a... Uh, we, I need to create an, and an, if you want to take a, tack at, a hack at this, please do. I'm going to create an R free database in the background so that we can actually do something real and, and try to mock that up, Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I would say that um, if you are um, caching, um, so information about a node inside a, um, in, 
uh, sorry, a, a path of nodes inside a node. That could be something that that's maybe maybe a hangover of what you're used to in another database technology. Um, so I guess this is um, the the way that I read it is um, this is kind of a um, denormalization approach where you're caching the information because that information is there um, or that information is 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 um, is needed. Uh, what you could do instead is um, instead of having the information from those nodes cached in a um, in a property on that node, instead just use the the power of relationships just to traverse out from that transaction node to each one of those in the sequence. You could have a property on the relationship to say you know this is number one in the sequence, this is number two in the sequence, um, and then you could collect it that way, um, or you can create intermediate nodes and then create like a linked list of uh, nodes that link from the transaction to the um, um, to, to those nodes from the, the path. I think I, I broadly agree with Adam. So let's say, um, let, let's take uh, match C customer name, Tony Rowden. Um, and then we're going to match uh, some path to an order. Uh, let's say um, order ID of this. All I'm doing here is I'm creating a simple path. Okay, so we've got a simple path here. Now, whenever we take a path in Cypher, we can, for example, return the nodes of that path and then as our result set we get a list of nodes um and x in nodes dot p id x so what this would do for example is it would return for each path that we can find between you know between these two nodes it would return an array of the ids in that path okay so the original question was I want to build a transaction node and it has as a property a list of nodes from a path in their ordinal order. Any thoughts on how I can address that? Well, here's a little cipher query that would do exactly that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to match a path. This is how you would do that. Then I'm going to use the nodes function that just returns the nodes in the path in their ordinal order. And then for each of those, I'm using this little cipher um, pattern comprehension here that extracts just the ID of the node. And so this is what would be the property value, okay? It would be an array of long integers that are the ID of every node in order in the path. So that's the narrow answer to the question, but I agree with Adam. It's like Neo4j is optimized to traverse lots of relationships really fast. So I've got a, a small database here and we pulled out all of these different paths in 230 milliseconds. And so if you know that you can reconstitute that path whenever you want, I guess I would question whether or not you want to store that property in the first place. Um, if in the middle of this, let's say that you store this property and then somebody goes and inserts three extra nodes in the middle of the path or your database changes as it will, then your properties are going to become stale and you're not really going to be able to rely on them. So unless I had like a really overwhelming performance oriented reason why I had to do it this way, I would probably match the paths as I went and I wouldn't store them in a property. That's a really great question though. That's a really killer question there. Um, does that about, does that about cover that one, Adam, or anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. I think that covers it. Yeah. I think it's, it's all about, um, again, like <laughs> everything depends, but, um, I, I think in this case, you've, you've maybe got the, um, you, you've got the benefit here of being able to use the structure of a graph and kind of like the, those relationships from a node um, to, to, to kind of give you the, the speed and the, the performance that you wouldn't get in, a, um, in another um, category of database, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one way of thinking about it is like every database makes a certain kind of operation really cheap and easy. And so in a relational database, when you're storing data as a table, basically you can think about it as in memory, there's one record and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. 
And so if what you want to do is scan through millions and millions of records and filter them, relational databases are really good at that because they're entirely laid out for it. And in a graph database, what do we do? We store things connected. So if what you want to do is bounce back and forth or between all of these different nodes and traverse long paths, you may as well do that with the database because it's literally what it's set up to do. Thanks for the question, Isaac. Oh no, I just I just uh, uh, closed a question on without meaning to do that. Archive, Christian. Um, this is a question about the GraphQL library. Merge mutations are not yet auto-generated like its GraphQL JS pre predecessor. Do we have sample code on how to do this? Christian, you got me stumped on this one. I personally do not have the code handy of how we would do um, those kinds of merges. I mean, off the top of my head, I think that you could use a custom cipher directive to do it. Um, that's, of course, not auto-generated. You'd have to write the code yourself, but it, would, it should be doable today. More broadly, what I've heard from our GraphQL team is that they're building a lot of these types of features that users really liked about the predecessor into it, although I don't have a specific timeline for you on that. Um, uh, that's about the limit of my knowledge on this one. Do you have any, anything further you know, Adam? Um, so certain mutations are generated when you... Um when you def define your types um so I'm, I'm trying to scratch around in um <laughs> in, in another window to try and find out what these are uh, what these are um but for example let say i had a um a post type and i had a, a user type um i would get a um a mutation called like um update posts i get create posts um and um a few others so, so i could say um for for a post type um, I could do um, the update post mutation, so I could define the where, and I could define the, um, the kind of like the, the what I, what I wanted to to create, um, what I wanted to to delete from that from that operation. Um, so it's all if you go into the to the manual and then mutations um, on the left hand side, yeah. Um, so the, there's a list there of of, of things that, that that are auto generated for for a particular type. Um, so yeah, that that should that should give you something. Um, and that gives you then the the nest the, the ability to create a nested graph within that structure as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for anybody else who's listening, um, the GraphQL library stuff is really cool, and it's one of the central ways that a lot of folks are now building full stack apps on top of Neo4j. So essentially, what they do is they use the GraphQL library in front of the database and expose. Uh, um, a custom GraphQL API, they define these kinds of types, and those types map to stuff that's stored inside of their graph. And then they can write a front-end application, something like React, Vue, Redwood, and you know, whatever your framework of choice is. And they use Apollo clients to access that GraphQL library. And so then Neo4j plus uh, the GraphQL library acts as like a complete backend for, for an application in essence, and uh, lets you just get, get quickly started with rapid prototyping and building any kind of app under the sun on top of graph. If you've seen any of Will Lyon's content, um, Will Lyon is a guy who works with Adam and me all the time. Uh, he writes about this stuff and he was the originator of the, of the grand stack idea. Uh, which was GraphQL, Apollo, Neo4j, and GraphQL. No, sorry. <laughs> GraphQL, Apollo, Neo4j, and uh, the database. So uh, thank you for that question. Um, let's see, live right now. Uh, oh, Christian's got a reference for us. Let's pull it up. Let's take a quick look. All right, auto-generate merge mutations, yep, yep. Okay, Daryl right here is one of our internal engineers who actually works on this library. Um, okay, that's what Daryl thinks. It's definitely going to get done, but there's not a timeline for it. Um, looks like there's a lot of discussion here. Um, I'm not necessarily in a position to say what the right or the wrong of this particular discussion is, but Christian, if you want to follow up and like we left our contact information on this first slide, like you can reach out to us on Twitter or whatever else, um, we can try to connect you with these people if you have a more detailed question that hasn't been addressed in this thread. Um, so 
Christian, I'm, I, I trust you're going to follow up with us um, and, and we'll, we'll take more of the details of that offline and try to connect you with the right people. Um, so one of the things while we're waiting for more questions to come in, um, I wanted to kind of show off is um, the idea of the Neo4j data importer. For folks who are new and getting started with Aura, you'll notice that if you go in now under the open button, you're going to get an option that says Neo4j data importer which is in beta now. Um, and so in this data importer, I am going to see if I can find my little world cities file. Uh, browse. Uh, let's see. I'm going to import a little CSV file called world cities. And I'm going to show you what that looks like on my desktop. Do, do, do. Bear with me here just a moment. While my software opens up. OK, so World Cities is a simple CSV file that has the name of a city, its ASCII name, its latitude, its longitude, what country it's in, the country codes associated with that country, and then also, for example, like the capital. Um, so for a given city, um, uh, it may ha it, it may act as the provincial capital within a particular country, let's say. So what the Neo4j data importer is intended to do is to allow you to pull in whatever your raw data is and to be able to quickly, quickly create kind of like a visual mapping. So we're going to create a node called city. And in that city, we're going to say that its data comes from the uh, worldcities.csv file, and we're going to add its ASCII name, its latitude, and its longitude, and its population, and its ID. So those are going to be all the properties of our city. We're going to add a separate node, and we're going to say that this one is called country. And we've got data about countries in our world cities file too. So the properties of country are the name, its ISO2, and its ISO3 code. And so then we need to relate these things. So we're going to draw a line from city to country. And we're going to label that as the in relationship. And so now we've got to tell it, how do we actually import this data? Well, the in relationship comes from that same world cities. Um, and it says, oh, well, we need an ID for our city and we need an ID for our country. So let's go into the city node. And um, Let's see, uh, the ID property is going to be, let's say it's ID. And in the country, the ID is going to be its ISO3 code. So now we can go back to this in relationship and we can say that a city ID maps to a country ISO3 code. And that is now a complete data model mapping, if you will. Um, for how cities relate to countries from this particular CSV file. So we can see that basically what we've done is we've defined um, a graph data model here at center. We already had a tabular data model on the left with worldcities.csv, and we've just defined this mapping between them. So up here in the triple dot menu, we can open the model, we can download the model uh, so that we can, for example, save and recreate this later, or we can run the import. Uh, let's go ahead and do it. Um, let me see if I got my password for this database handy. Uh, uh, bear with me, lovely people. I'm trying not to put all of my passwords up on the screen. And I'm going to put in the password here, and I'm just going to click Run. Let's we'll see if I've messed this up on the first time. This is a live software demo without a, without a net, so who knows? I may have messed this up. We'll see. So it's running the import. It's connecting. OK, it's already through 30, 67%, et cetera, et cetera, 91%. Oh my gosh, it, it worked. Whew. Imagine my relief. So you can see that we set 77,000 properties. We created 12,000 nodes, 12,000 labels, and so on. You can even ask it to basically show you what the load query was. And so if you figure that all of these CSV records are being loded in, this is literally how Neo4j did it. So, all right, the proof's in the pudding. 
is this really going to work? Match C city turn C limit 20. All right, let's look at the graph. We've got our labels here. I want I want to look at this differently. I want to label it by the city name. I don't want to label it by the longitude. Let's expand that city. And then we see that that city is in Kosovo and we can see all the other cities in Kosovo. What if we do something like match C country ISO 3 uh, Jur? I think that's the ISO 3 for Germany. We're going to find out. Uh, all right, let's try USA because I don't remember the ISO 3 code for Germany off the top of my head. So, D so here we've got the. It, sorry? DEU, maybe? DEU? Like Deutschland? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Bam! There you go. It was Deutschland. Okay. So let's expand Germany. And we can see all of the cities in Germany, like Essen, Kassel, Wuppertal, Bonn. All right. So we've got things like, for example, population. Um, so we can do things like match, see. Let's do this. Let's match that country and look for cities in Germany uh, where city.population greater than 1 million people. Oh, you know what? We've got a mistake here that we're going to need to correct really quickly. And that is when you import the data from, from uh, um, CSV, it's always a string, right? So we're going to do match C city, set c.population equals two int c.population, um, return count C, and we're going to coerce all of those string populations into integers and see what it works. Oops. We forget our syntax sometimes. Bam, 12,000 cities. We just changed the population from strings to integers. And now we're going to get all the cities with a population of more than um, city dot city dot city city dot population. Here are the ten most popular populous cities in Germany by population. Berlin comes in number one at three point four million people. So um, Neo4j data importer, the point of going through this little miniature demo is that we've just added new tooling to Aura in the last week or so that lets you get data in from CSV, easy as pie. Um, if you need to uh, come back later, relook at the video of this stream, you can see me step through this, uh, this demo again. Look at all the little pieces in terms of adding a node, adding a relationship, creating mappings between them, setting keys on your node types, and so forth. When I'm done with all of that, I can uh, open my model and, uh, sorry, I can uh, save my model and be able to come back and execute the same type of transform on a different database. Uh, anything that you want to add on the uh, data importer, uh, Adam, or do you want to go back to questions? Um, so shameless plug on that one, but um, there is a, a whole module on, on there in the um, importing CSV data course on Graph Academy. Ooh, um, so if you head call. to graphacademy.neofj.com, um, and then in the beginner track, uh, there's a, a course called Importing CSV Data. Um, and there's a, a lesson and a hands-on exercise for uh, importing, I think it's movies, um, or maybe movies and actors into, uh, in, into the database. Great call. You know, I, one of the things I really love about these courses is how they have like lots of hands-on activities built into them where you get to actually play with the technology, not just read a, a textbook. And they also all have like videos throughout. So some people like to learn with audiovisual content. Some people like to learn with reference materials. Some people like to learn by getting their hands dirty. And these courses work in all of those different ways. Um, great place to start. Uh, definitely check out all of Graph Academy if you have not already. Because if you're the sort of person who's coming to our office hours and you have questions and you want to figure out how things work, this is a great place for self-paced discovery of all of those things. Um, Let's see, will you provide an example or use case of when you would want to include more than one node label? I'm trying to understand this from a modeling perspective. 
Rich, uh, that is a great question. We were a minute ago um, talking about graph data modeling and labels. Um, there is a, um, a post on here that's going to give you the very long answer. Um, uh, you can take a look at this at your leisure. But so the thing with multiple labels, people use them in different ways. Sometimes people use labels as a way of creating like a Boolean. A particular node is or is not a friend. It is or is not a, a, a person or an enemy or a coworker or whatever the case may be in your model. Um, one of the things that can get a little bit messy is when people use more than one node label for like multiple inheritance you know so for example people will try to apply taxonomic labels in their graph and they'll say like this node is a vehicle and an airplane versus this other one is a vehicle and a um and a uh, car you know um those kinds of taxonomic uses where you're where you're applying more than one label to a node are a good use case for more than one node label. Um, the, the, the one warning that I would give you is that you need some sort of an application or software layer that gates that and that can control who can apply which labels to which nodes so that it doesn't get completely out of order and confusing. You know, So you would not want to end up in a situation where you had a node that was a vehicle, a car, an airplane, and a duck all at the same time. So the, the, the taxonomy maintenance or the ontology maintenance, if you will, is out of scope for what Neo4j is providing and needs to be provided at the app layer. But that taxonomic categorization is one example of more than one, one node label. A second example that I can think of off the top of my head, and maybe you've got some too, Adam, is um, namespacing. So a common reason people apply more than one node is that they're, you know, they might have one single Neo4j graph that has five customers for them worth of data inside of that graph. And so everybody has basically the same schema. Like let's say they have customers and orders and parts and, and shipping details, but they apply a tenant label on top. So a customer record inside of the database would be a tenant A customer versus a tenant B customer. And in that way, their software layer can look for one label and cut out an entire subgraph for a tenancy, whereas it can look at a different label in the semantic data model sense. Um, Adam? Um, so the, the example that we use in the uh, modeling course on, on Graph Academy is uh, the recommendations data set. Um, so in that, we've got um, we've got people um, who have um, some sort of interaction with a uh, with a film. So they could have acted in, or they could have directed, or they could have rated the film. Um, so the the most common use case I, I found for kind of multiple labels is, um, say for example, we have a um, a person, so Tom Hanks. Um, Tom Hanks has acted in, I mean, so many movies, um, but he's also a director. Um, so what we could do uh, when we're searching for um, a for, well for for um, people that have interacted with with a certain movie, um, what we could do is we could say you know find me for for I mean let's say Toy Story for example, um, show me all of the um, people that have acted in that movie or all of the people um, who have a relationship with that movie, um, and then we could filter down based on a label. Um, so you could take all of the, the, the and I think it's one of the, the, the steps in, um, in in the modeling course is to uh, take all of the um, all of the people that have directed a movie and then give them a label of director and then find all the people that have a, an acted in relationship to anything um, and then uh, give them a label of actor. So then instead of looking through the whole data set of people, we can filter down. So we only search for... Um, actors or um, directors in the graph. So actually, instead of looking at a, um, a large portion of the graph, you're actually drilling down and you're, you're looking at a, a, a subgraph, I guess. Um, so that's the, the, the main reason that, that, that I would use um, for that. So it's basically sort of discoverability um, and then sort of uh, skimming things down. Um, you could also look at you know, things like if you had uh, users in, in a database, um, uh, maybe they would be um, a well, okay, so so in, in, in our internal databases that, that we use in DevRel, we have users, we have users that are certified, um, we have 
users that are GitHub users, that are um, Twitter users that have mentioned us in a, in, in a tweet. Uh, and then that allows us to search for uh, a subset of people rather than looking at, at like millions of users in a, uh, in a database. Yeah, that's an example of that kind of taxonomic stuff I was talking about. Like user is kind of like an abstract super class, but then like Twitter user, medium user, whatever the case may be, are specialized subsets of user. All right, uh, I think we've covered that one pretty thoroughly. Um, Oat. Oat asks, any plan for supporting custom APOC in RADB? Um, Oat, we covered this one a little bit earlier. The short version is probably no. So for a lot of reasons, custom plugins are difficult to support. There are some exceptions that we make for enterprise customers where they have very bespoke or high performance needs and they use custom plugins with RADB. Um, but by and large, um, we're probably going to go in a direction where we surface more types of functionality in Cypher rather than relying as much on plugins going forward. Um, any resources you'd recommend on freezing paths that we don't want to be editable for a given amount of time? Yes. Um, so basically, um, Inside of Neo4j Enterprise and RADB Enterprise, you get access to a whole set of fine-grained access control utilities. And so the way that all of this stuff works is that you can define roles within your database, and then you can define permissions of what those different roles can do. And so in the way that you're formulating your question, Isaac, the way that you would freeze a path is you don't want it to be editable. Well, a path it consists of some set of relationship types. Let's just say that it's the uh, friend of a friend type of a graph. The friend relationships between people might correspond to a path that you would want to freeze that you don't want it to be editable. The way that I would tend to control this in Neo4j today is I would give most of my users a particular role, like let's call them uh, API users, for example. And then I would define uh, permissions on that role. And I would say, well, that role is not allowed to edit the friend uh, um, uh, the friend relationship. And by controlling when the role can and can't edit it, you can lock and unlock paths eff effectively. Now, if you need really fine-grained support where only particular paths and not all of the friend relationship you're going to need to segregate that by a different relationship type so that you can lock it down with the with the role construct. Uh, do you have any thoughts, Adam? Um, no, nothing to add to that one, really. Okay, so you know, in closing, Isaac, like I would take a look at this particular chapter, fine-grained access control, and it's going to step you through um, basically uh, a use case and an example of how you define all of this stuff and how you grant roles to users, how you revoke roles from users, and how you can create, actually, this is probably the subsection you need, subgraph access control using privileges. Um, you're going to map that to user roles and so forth. All right. In Bloom and Browser, I'd like to set a property to pin some key nodes to an XY location or a compass direction and distance away. Any thoughts? Hmm, that's a good one. I got nothing. Uh, you, um, Adam, you want to add? Uh, do you have any thoughts on this one? Um, so I, I don't think it's something that you can do at the moment. Um, my, my initial thought um, as a um, JavaScript fan and web developer would be to build my own visualization for this. Um, so you, you, you can lock nodes in, um, in a particular visualization, but as soon as you refresh that, they're, they're gone. Um, but yeah, I think if if you're looking for something, um, you know, maybe a little bit more um, um, advanced than that, um, then I would look at building my own sort of um, a visualization, whether that's like a um, building it inside a, a React app or just using sort of D three or, or or something like that. Um, yeah, I think that would be the the solution that I would reach for. I don't think that this is strictly an answer to his question. I just want to point out a little small thing about browser here we're dealing with our cities and countries for a little while ago um so if we refresh this visualization okay we've got all these floating cities 
Now I'm going to explain, expand this one and it's gonna to link to Kosovo and you'll see that Kosovo is bouncing around. If I drag this, it will pin so that subsequent changes won't affect Kosovo. Now, if I highlight and hover on Kosovo, you'll see this little unlock icon. It's already pinned to that location. If I click unlock, it's gonna start bouncing around and now it doesn't have to stay in that same location in the visualization. Um, but on another hand, I think that this is not really the answer because like Adam said, as soon as you rerun your query or refresh the visualization, you've lost that very uh, ephemeral pin, if you will. Um, there is a feedback mechanism though for Bloom. If you'd like to raise that, we can try to connect you with that. Um, thanks for that question, Paul. Um, well, thank you, Isaac, appreciate it. We hope you've gotten some value out of it. Um, this is what we're here to do. Um, let's see, we've got about eight minutes left and we've reached the point where we've uh, exhausted the questions. Um, Adam, is there is there anything that you'd like to, to add or, oh, Oates coming in with another one. <laughs> um, is there the anything bounce. that you'd, you know, okay, o o Oates the buzzer beater today. Can I save a long cipher query as a function which I can call it as many times as I want with different input of the created function in RADB. Uh, I got some thoughts on this, but you can start if you want, Adam. Um, I'm happy for you to go first on that one while I uh, quickly type and find um, what I'm uh, well, double checking whether I can do what I'm thinking of in, uh, in Aura. Okay, so on this one, there's some good news and there's some bad news. Oh, um, the good news is, yeah, you can totally do that. The bad news is, is that this particular functionality isn't included in RADB as yet. So the way that this works is you're going to want to check out this page right here, custom cipher based procedures and functions. Um, and um, you're probably going to want to define a procedure, not a function, because procedures can match, merge, uh, return, all of, the, all of that good stuff. And so this is the simplest way of doing that. We're going to call, we're going to create a procedure called answer. And, uh, you know, I mean, our documentation writers must be like really big Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans or something like that, because 42 is, of course, the answer. It's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. So then every time you invoke the answer procedure, like call custom.answer yield row, then that's always going to be 42, and you'll see that you defined that. Um, this set of um, custom cipher procedures and functions is in a segment of, of APOC that we call APOC extended. And at the moment within RADB, only APOC core is supported. So if you try to go do this on RADB, it's not going to work. But if you download desktop or you use Neo4j Enterprise Edition and you enable ARA extended, this, this page is going to be the answer to that question. I hope that helps out. Um, I want to improve Neo4j performance. Thought to increase specific label and relation naming in node architecture. Can I get your opinions on this? Specific. Okay. Uh, hmm. So in terms of improving performance, we dealt with a query, a, a really simple query earlier. Like, let's take let's take this one just as an example. We were playing with this earlier. We run this query. Um, Cipher has this query uh, has this construct called explain that gives you a query plan, um, and it will literally tell you how the database is going to execute any given query. So. If you want to improve your Cypher query performance at the top level, what you're really doing is you're dealing with these kinds of query plans. And you'll see these little estimated DB hits, like these numbers here, like 18,936. And what you're trying to do is it's basically a game of making this plan more efficient and reducing this number so that the database has to do less work in order to return um, your query. I, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly afraid I can't really answer this question in the abstract because it just depends too much on what your query is, frankly. Um, 
what I can say as a, as a very general indication is that labels act as almost like a free index inside of the database. So if whenever you can make your query more specific in terms of which label or what smaller population of nodes you're going after, you're going to be getting better performance. Um, and the same is true for relationships. So whenever you can um, not talk about all of the relationships, but just a particular type, not even talk about all of a particular type, but subfilter by a, a property, for example, um, you're going to be improving your performance. And the reason for that is that it ties back to this database plan right here. And the more specific your query gets and the earlier you are specific in your query, the lower the number of database hits and the faster the overall performance of the query. Uh, anything to add, Adam? Um, we've got a fantastic course on Graph Academy for modeling. Um, if you want to go through some of the, the, the theory behind these decisions, then um, then uh, the, it's it's all there. Um, I would say um, kind of get your opinions on this. Yes, absolutely do it. Um, in terms of Mark's uh, blog post, um, the, those rules and um, the, 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 the ideas and suggestions in that blog post absolutely still uh, remain true. Um, and as, as as David said, like you, you're looking at reducing the, the number of database hits, not necessarily the, the time of, of the the query to run, because the more you run a query, a run the query on warm data or on sorry on, on a warm database, then um, that that query will get quicker. Um, but yeah, reducing the, the number of database hits. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, on searching for um, only for actors on the actor label rather than all people and then filtering down based on um based on actor um well based on the the, the relationship type um that will make your your queries more performant um we, we could have like for example just a relationship between um every person and, and every actor that was just like is in and then there could be properties on that and that's not necessarily the, the best way to do that because you have to then filter down based on properties whereas we want to use the structure of the graph to, to fill it down um so there's already been that step of a um, um, ha, uh, uh, acted in and directed uh, relationships, which is kind of a the, the, the first step of modeling. Um, it's always my opinion that you go directly for the most specific um, um, sort of naming conventions uh, in, in terms of relationship types. So rather than like, uh, I guess like the, David, in your example earlier, you just had in as the... Um, mm -hmm. Is, is the relationship type now that may not be a problem if you're just going um like if you start off on on a um a node and there's only one relationship type which is like that from that node and that there's, there's no problem there um if, if you start going into kind of more complex um like uh multi um, multi hop queries or a variable length queries where you do like a, a star so you could say find me everything between one and five degrees of this person um then it starts to to, to get difficult um, so yeah, I, I would always um, be as specific as possible early on, knowing that it's very easy to add two relationship types to a query if if um, if, if if you need to to search for something like that. That's a great point. Uh, thank you for that question. Those questions. Uh, and I think since we're right at time, Isaac, we'll, we'll give you the last question and then we're going to have to, to cut off for today, but no fear, we're going to keep doing these kinds of events as long as there's user interest in them. Related to my value range question earlier, can a relationship be established between a node and a portion of the value range on the second node? Uh, my gut feel on this one is that, that if you find yourself in a position where you need to do that, there's some sort of a, there, there may be a modeling error somewhere else in the process. Like, um, so if, if a portion of the value range is a valuable concept to you, make it a node and then relate to the node that is the valuable concept that you need to talk about. Um, in Neo4j, there isn't a way to define a relationship that points to only part of the node, but not other another part of the node. So I guess like my, my, my gut feeling on this one is that like some more work is needed on the data model and on the domain in this case. And uh, nodes and relationships are cheap. Define as many of them as you want. And so maybe this node that has a value range you need to break that up a little bit and you need to 
take the value range, turn the value range itself as a first class item in your graph. That way the node can link to the value range and you can then link from that node to partial value ranges if you want as separate nodes and then relate other nodes to partial value ranges. So I wouldn't try to do what you're, what, what you're asking directly. I would probably reconsider the model and then it would always back into something very simple. You're just linking a node to another node. At the end of the day, that's all it is. Uh, anything you wanna add, Adam? Um, no, I mean that, that sounds good to me. I just my my opinion would, on this would, or my suggestion would be just to write down on a on, on a piece of paper what you're trying to achieve. Like in just in in, in plain English, um, highlight the the nouns, highlight the verbs, uh, and then there's your, your your graph structure there. Uh, there's there's a concept I think you can Google called um, intermediate nodes, um, where you have a a node that kind of sits between um, two nodes. And I think it, to me this sounds like the the kind of thing you're looking for. Yep, so sometimes people use the arrows application, which I was just briefly showing, and they kind of sketch an idea and it's you know no more commitment than a whiteboard really. You can try out different ideas, try on what the cipher queries against those models would be like and so on and so forth. Thanks for the question, Isaac. And uh, with that, um, really appreciate everybody's uh, participation and time today. Um, uh, Alex, uh, we're just wrapping up, and I, I, I hope um, we're going to be able to do this again in the future. I hope so, too. Uh, that was great. Cool. Uh, thank you definitely for your time, uh, De David and Adam. Uh, that was that was really, really good. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Uh, without the questions, this, this whole format obviously would be uh, very, very uh, or boring definitely so we we three would have to talk <laughs> about things instead of answering your uh your questions instead so uh it's great to see uh see them come in and hope this was helpful for you um like david said we will do this uh, again in the future uh so collect your questions until then we make an announcement uh, uh probably over the next couple of uh of weeks for the next session um until then, you can obviously ask a question in the community. Uh, go to uh, community.neovj.com. Go, go to Discord. Um, if you type in uh, exclamation mark Discord in YouTube or Twitch, you get the link to that. Um, uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, Stack Overflow, wherever else you, you want to direct your, your, uh, your attention to. Then people are, are there to help you out. Um, if not us uh, in the next session uh, when we run this uh, or db office hour again if you are um, because bloom came up uh, a little bit and you're new to bloom and you would like to learn tomorrow we are running a workshop on bloom so if you are interested in learning that join us then um, we have more live streams coming over the next few days as well on thursday a new for j live session um under the hood and next tuesday as well so uh, follow and subscribe on Twitch or YouTube to get notified when we go live uh, next time. Um, yeah, until then, I, I guess uh, have a good rest of your day, uh, wherever you are, uh, enjoy your week. And um, yeah, thank you again, David and Adam. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.